It is my duty, pursuant to Standing Order 38, to inform the House that the questions to be raised tonight at the time of adjournment are as follows. The Honourable Member for Rimouski, Nejet Tamaskatali Basque, Private Lumber Producers. The Honourable Member for Kitchener Centre, Ethics. Resuming debate, the Honourable Member for Winnipeg North. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And I'm pleased to uh, join the discussion for this first round of uh, on Bill C-51, an act which amends in very, very large measures the Food and Drug Act. Mr. Speaker, I bring to this debate a lot of skepticism. Let me say I think it's a healthy dose of skepticism. So the history of this whole aspect of Health Canada and our regulatory regime here in Canada. It will be as no surprise to you, Mr. Speaker, to learn that, in fact, this is the fifth attempt by government in the last decade to change, to overhaul the Food Act. Four times before, the Liberals attempted to so. And each time they failed. Why, Mr. Speaker? Because, in fact, community spoke up and demanded more accountability from government and much clearer answers to accountability and regulatory authority. Four times, Mr. Speaker, the Liberals tried, and you will recall Bill C-80 was a draft piece of legislation to do very much what we have before us today, a bill that was attempting to supposedly modernize our food and drug provisions, bring us into the 21st century, bring our rules and our regulations in line with modern-day science. Mr. Speaker, it didn't take too long for Canadians to quickly figure out that this was a ruse, a cover, an attempt to make Canadians believe the government was going to be on their side, but in fact was really loosening its hold over regulations and minimizing its role and moving us away from what has been an entrenched part of our history. And that is a bill that regulates safety of food and drugs in such a serious manner that it is part of the criminal code. It is a bill, it is legislation, which operates, or at least did operate, on the basis of the do no harm principle, the precautionary principle, which means you don't allow products on the market unless you have F that they are safe beyond a reasonable doubt. That's the do-no-harm principle. It's not the buyer-beware principle. It's not the risk management model that we've seen with the Liberals before and with the Liberals today. There's a marked difference between the do-no-harm principle and the risk management model. Do-no-harm says let's put patients first, let, let's put people first, let's put safety first. The risk management model says, well, we can only go so far in assuring Canadians of safety. Therefore, we're going to let them on the market, and then we're going to see what happens. Now, it's up to you, individual Canadians, to determine whether or not it's worth taking the risk. And it's up to the corporations that produce the products to regulate themselves and decide if they're in line or not with standards on paper. But it is not a proactive regulatory model that puts the needs and concerns of Canadians first. It is an effective model that puts the needs of big pharma and large corporations and global capital forces ahead of ordinary citizens. It is a model that, in fact, makes guinea pigs out of Canadians. Mr. Speaker, we have had our share in this tree of offering up people as guinea pigs for large pharmaceutical corporations. 
I don't need to tell you about the incidents in our past, especially when women were treated as guinea pigs. Thalidomide comes to mind, Depo-Provera, breast implants, and the list goes on. So the question we have to ask today, if we cut through all the rhetoric and all the tough talk about putting safety first and modernizing our system, are we better off? Are we any closer to the kind of system that Canadians thought we had and expect to have that was abandoned by the Liberals? Abandoned when in 1997, the Minister of Health, Alan Rock, in his first gesture as Minister of Health, killed the Federal Drug Laboratory, killed the Federal Research Lab, one independent lab we had in this country, Fort Sting, on post-market surveillance basis for testing whether drugs that were on the market were safe, for testing whether there was any negative consequences when that drug was in with certain foods or other drugs or natural health products, a drug that formed a very important safety basis in our country today. That was the beginning, Mr. Speaker, of a whole string of actions taken by the then Minister of Health, Alan Rock, and subsequent minister, Liberal Ministers of Health to dismantle our regulatory system, to move us away from the do-no-harm model, to move us towards a system where, in fact, corporations pay for their drug approval process. The bulk of the fees for our drug approval process come from the corporations themselves. There have been numerous incidents, numerous examples from scientists in Health Canada who have said enough is enough and they've spoken out. I think Dr. Michelle Brill Edwards who spoke up about being cornered to approve something she thought was not safe. She had to leave Health Canada have any sense of integrity intact. And there were many others, Mr. Speaker, who can forget the whole group of veterinary, and sci veterinary scientists who stood tall about tampering with food products and with, uh, with alteration and modification of veterinarian drugs and were hostized and disciplined and lambasted by the Liberal government. Whatever happened to government being a bastion of independent, objective science operated on the basis of the constituents it's supposed to serve? Whatever happened to government for the people, by the people, of the people? Nowhere is this more important than when it comes to food that we have to eat, drugs that we take because of medical conditions, water that we drink because it's just us. Nowhere is that more important than in food and drugs and water. Yet on that very theme, in that same area, government has abandoned us, abandoned Canadians in large measure. So today, we're supposed to believe that the Conservative Government of Canada has such integrity and such courage and such vision that it's offering us a blueprint for a do-no-harm precautionary model around drugs and food. Well, Mr. Speaker, that's why I bring to this debate a dose of healthy skepticism, because I've seen nothing from Conservatives to date that lends me to, lets me believe, in fact, this government is on the side of ordinary families and Canadians, and is not on the side, first and foremost, of the big corporations and their profit margins. I haven't seen that when it comes to housing, education, health care, women's equality, people with disabilities, environment, jobs, child care. I haven't seen this government stand up for Canadians yet. As my colleague from London Financial says, nor will we. And that's why I bring to this debate my concerns. That's not to say that there aren't some good provisions in this bill, Mr. Speaker. That's not to say that I don't recognize that this government has moved a significant distance from the days of the Liberals. Ironically, this legislation is more proactive 
than the Liberals ever present this house. Now, it's still got lots of problems, still doesn't mean we're necessarily going to support it, but it is a step forward. And let me point to a couple of those uh, initiatives. There is, in this bill, provisions for recall. 